slowly but surely the picture builds, things start coming together. Sometimes, like, like I did, you go around in circles for 10 years. Because you're on one side of the coin and you haven't actually got to the other, you haven't, you know, well, you're on one side of the coin and you're just going round the milling because you just can't get to the other side of the coin basically. It's going round and round and round in a circle on the milling of the coin, you know. You've worked out the nickel side of things and the serpentine connection and all that, but you haven't got to the other side which is the manganese, you know. Because you've got, you've got to put the the time and the effort in you, you've got to work out the levels. You, you've got to know, well, if I go too far, you know, even if, even if I'm doing the right thing, I can get to a toxic level, you know? You know, we all need salt, but if you give, give a person too much salt, you can kill them. You've got to know the limit, limits and things like that. That takes time to build those sort of things up. That takes time and effort. You've got to buy plants, you've got to run experiments to the end you know you can see a plant starting to die but you've got to keep the experiment running in case something you notice out the corner of your eye something else happens and you notice something that leads you on to the next step you know people may laugh at you but you know at the outlandish experiments you've done and, and yes you even even yourself you can admit yes looking back on some of them they were pretty outlandish I tried building myself a milk bottle greenhouse. I only got two out of the three factors I was looking for. I was looking for bright sunlight, high humidity and a cool temperature. All I got was bright sunshine and a cool temperature. I didn't get the humidity. So, you know, but maybe now that we're living in a, hopefully a solar powered Australia, we can use some of the solar power to run a humidifier in a, in a situation like that, you know? Maybe, yeah, so you can prove your point eventually. But you know, we're not living in a King John Howard 1950s Australia, we're actually living in a progressive, you know, futuristic Australia where we value our ecosystem because it's given us so much. It's taught us the dependence on nickel and manganese and a new form of physical chemical nitrogen fixation, not a biological one. No wonder. No one can find it because it's it's a physical chemical one. It doesn't involve bloody organisms. It happens physically, and because it happens physically, chemically, it happens very rapidly. You can actually watch it happening, and isn't that the proof? If you can see something happening, that's part of the proof. Well, I can see it happening, and it's happening really fast. That's amazing. It happens that fast. And once you get the recipe, you can do it too. You can watch it happening. You can watch it seeing that it's happening. You can see that it's happening so fast. And you can see that it's going to the same colour as peat. Very similar, if not identical, to the colour of peat. Isn't that rather funny, rather strange? You know, that of all the things you try to grow CPs in, you're basically stuck with peat uh, on, on a um, practical cultivational thing. But it has a certain colour. What is that? Why does it have a certain colour, you know? I may be rambling, but am I making a point? When you see the colour, you think, oh my God, that colour is so familiar to me, because I've been seeing that colour for most of my cultivational life. And is the penny going to drop? That peat is a high nitrogen source? I mean, all the books say these things. I mean, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying anything that's not already in the books. It's just a different way of looking at it all. You know, once you once you built the, the scientific method on firm foundation, it allows you to look at things in a proper, sensible fashion, a testable fashion. Eventually, you get to you go from the uh, the qualitative to the quantitative, then you go from the, uh, you end up in the in the precision part, where you start predicting things, and you start doing experiments and testing whether your prediction is correct or not, you know? Am I gonna put this stuff on the bloody gutless sand? Is this gutless sand gonna turn into gutful sand? Am I gonna be able to grow a capensis in the front lawn? You know, 
how is it going to change CPs worldwide? Hey? So you don't have to buy all these expensive bales of peat, you know, I mean, people talk, oh, I don't want to use peat, I want to use coir, and no, I don't want to use coir, I want to use sawdust, well, I've already been there and done that sort of thing, you know, there's enough peat in Canada for the next 600 years, and then there's enough peat under permafrost across Russia to last the next 600,000 years, you may have to have big, giant, dinosaur-sized machines, bigger than the stuff they use here in mining in Australia, to get, dig it out, and of course you've got the problem with the methyl hydrate as well, the greenhouse gas. Um, but really, it's a moot point. There's plenty of peat out there, more than enough for your lifetime, more than enough for many, many generations of lifetimes. So it's a moot point about whether you want to say, you know, to grow these things in peat or not. But wouldn't it be better to grow them? In something that doesn't have any peat in there at all, something that's more akin to the natural soil in the country where they have more species than any other on the planet. The most, the, uh, the saltiest, the most bushfire prone country on the planet with the most CPs. You know. Do any of these dots start connecting together? They all always grow bigger, faster, and more colourful after a bushfire. So, you know. As you say, you've got to ask yourself, what is ash and why is it so alkaline? Once you start asking those sort of questions and start getting some of the answers, you know, you start to figure out that things are not quite what they seem out in the real world. And that's why they're better out in the real world. Because up to now, we haven't actually been doing anything that's uh, <laughs> really going on out in the real world back in the greenhouse. But now we can. And that's why we'll get practical, rapid uh, responses and results. Mark my words. Whether I should upload these videos now, people will laugh at them now, but six months down the track they won't be laughing anymore. Because we'll slowly start ticking off the boxes. Rumex, rhubarb, gunnera, you know, and start going through the CPs one at a time, you know, Serocenia, Dionea, Cephalodus, and st suddenly... <laughs> When you start growing them all really well, very quickly, very big, very robust, very colourfully, maybe the penny will drop. There's an alternative reality out there. Yes, it's the reality that's out there in the natural world. We're just bringing it back into the greenhouse, using the scientific method to lasso it back and improve on it. Because Mother Nature does everything basically, you know, at a random in a random way. She chucks things around from a geological uh, perspective. You know, she can't control the level things to any great extent. You know, but you can do that. You can tweak all the variables. Once you know what's going on, you can tweak all the variables. You can have the right temperature in your greenhouse. You can have the right intensity of light. You can have the right spectrum of light. If you know that because they're using nickel and manganese, they're using a particular photo system. And, and you know that particular photo system has a particular uh, band in the spectrum. Things like that. Maybe you won't just be using polythene in your greenhouse, you'll be using a particular type of polythene in your greenhouse. Because the scientific method is telling you to use that particular type. And if you get better results, as of the result of putting in that particular thing, well, just bogues well for the scientific method, doesn't it? It works really well when it's built on firm foundations. It's just that in the area of CPs, it's never been built on firm foundations in the past, you know? All this eating the insects for the nitrogen, it's just a load of bollocks, basically. It just doesn't stand up to any basic scientific testing. But no one was willing to put their hand up and say, Oi, it doesn't work. There's something wrong here. And they, no, they didn't want to rock the boat. They were career scientists, you know, not willing to rock the boat because, you know, they might be retiring in a few years' time and it might upset their retirement settlement. They weren't really true scientists, basically. A true scientist is willing to put their hand up. We were supposed to have free and open communication, you know, as part of the scientific method. So where does all this peer review bunking comes in. How can that be free and open communication when you've got to go through a middle person first? You can't actually have your say and 
you know, put in a paper and have it published and then live or die on on the contents of your paper. No, it has to be either modified by someone else or it either doesn't get published or you have to go back and rewrite it incorporating someone else's ideas into it. And then, then, then personally you feel, well, it's not really my paper anymore, is it? It's not really my words or something like that. You have all those sort of problems. And then you've got the idea of your intellectual property rights, which is a load of bunkum, really. You know, it's a load of crap. You know, if you're a true scientist, you give credit where credit is due, sort of thing. That's the true intellectual property rights. You're honourable enough as a scientist to say, that idea is someone else's idea, it's not my own. And you state it, you know. They're like, Alan Lowry has that idea about the polypomphalic traps are uh, 180 degrees around the other way. I accredit him for that idea, though I've read in other older bulletins that it might not actually be his idea, it might actually be Steve Rose's idea, so I also state that as well. But you know, I still credit him with having written that, but I also mentioned that I have read similar wording and, wor and verbiage coming out of Steve Rose in an older, uh, lesser known Australian carnivorous plant journal that came out in the late 1970s, I think. So, uh, and also in some of the old black and white CPNs, you know. Uh, so I, I, I have to, being a scientist, I have to do both. Give Alan Lowry some credit for that idea, which I think is a really good idea, because if your traps have evolved to be 180 degrees around the other way, surely that's a really good reason for keeping the name Polypomphalix. And I think it's a lovely, gorgeous name. And I think we'll start a new clip and go down this track, I think.